Hello, my favorite Religion 211 Spring students. Hopefully you are well and happy. Uh, let's see, let's go over a couple of things before we begin. One, before you listen to uh, watch the lectures, I hope you'll say a prayer and I hope you'll give yourself like just a minute of just calm kind of meditation. You could even listen to some music or something because we all understand that you've got to be in the right mindset, right? In order to really learn um, and to really, you know, uh, understand the things of the spirit, you've got to come to a just a higher level of of thinking, right? So uh, I hope you'll do that. I, I'm obviously not going to force you or have you report on that or anything, but I hope you will. Uh, I just think it makes a profound difference. It really does. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think we sing before we start sacrament meeting, and then we sing before we, um, before we have the sacrament, right? It's this idea of like preparing your mind uh, and kind of uh, uniting uh, we, you know, pray and sing and pray. So um, we're missing that in our class, unfortunately, but hopefully it's something that you uh, wouldn't mind doing uh, at home. I think it really will make a difference. All right. Um, as far as class goes, we'll talk uh, on our uh, Thursday. We have, um, we have our meeting at 10 o'clock, our Zoom, our live Zoom at 10 o'clock on Thursday. And all of you need to be there for that. And maybe you already have if you're watching this later. Uh, and then um, we can answer questions about like the syllabus and uh, uh, reporting and things like that. Uh, of course, you can always email Danica uh, or text Danica or call her and just say, hey, can you explain this to me? I'm just not quite getting it. No problem at all. Um, Danica and I are used to having, you guys get this, we are used to having about 600 students per semester. I actually have 1,200 students every semester, uh, but I have two TAs. So Danica is used to having 600 students every semester. And uh, she's, um, you guys, this, this spring term, she, you're like 75 students. So she is uh, excited to be able to be available for all of you. So please, um, make sure you use Danica. Oh, I'm using my hands here, shaking the screen. Uh, make sure you use Danica um, and, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask her questions. Okay. Uh, if you, I, I would, you know, um, I'm trying to think of anything that most of you might be questioning, but I guess I'll just find out at the, uh, at the Zoom meeting. All right. So let's get into our material. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I love uh, all of this, uh, uh, all of this stuff. I just, I get really excited over the idea of talking about the history of the Bible and the history of Israel. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, now, if you were to say, okay, um, if you were to say, how did the New Testament, um, the ones we're studying, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how did they get from the pens of those um, of, of, of those men uh, to your phone, right? Over the course of 2,000 years. How many 2,000-year-old uh, books do you have on your phone? Probably not very many. Um, so why and how did these ones get there? Can you name anyone who you think would be instrumental in getting uh, the, the works from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to your, to your phone? Anyone along that timeline? Can you think of anyone? Um, you might think of the name like uh, William Tyndale or um, Gutenberg or uh, John Wycliffe uh, or um, Steve Jobs or uh, you know, Thomas Monson was the one who, um, President Monson was the one who created the font. Uh, he was a publisher and he created the font for the paper scriptures that we have. Um, so there's a lot of people involved in this story and obviously we can't cover it all today, but I think as we, as, as we look at it, you're going to gain a more of appreciation for, uh, the Bible and for the people who enabled you to just to have it, right? Sometimes we open up the scriptures on our phone and we don't think about those who enabled us to do this. This is such an incredible blessing. So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, we're, we're going to have to boil it down to four people just 
for time's sake. There are way more than four people involved in this story, uh, and I wish we could. I wish we could cover them all. I, I would love to teach a full semester just on uh, the history of the Bible, but. Uh, since we only have one day to do it, uh, that's okay. We're just, we'll connect, um, we'll, we'll tell a story with these four. Now, these aren't the most important four. Uh, they are important figures, uh, but they, they kind of create a cohesive story. They kind of, they, they all connect. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. Uh, if you looked at these four, probably who's the most famous, I would say, is probably Henry VIII. Most, I think if you asked a lot of people who's Henry VIII, they would say he's a king, right? Uh, and they've heard of him before. Um, probably the least known on this list would be St. Jerome, don't you think? I, I, a lot of my students have never even heard of St. Jerome um, and don't understand how important he is to the history here. So we're going to connect these four today. Um, by the way, for my class, you do not need to take notes. Um, some of you maybe even in my class before, but you do not need to take notes during the lecture. What I want you doing during the lecture is just paying attention. Just give me a hundred percent of your focus and really try to envision what we're talking about. I've noticed that notes can be distracting um, from that experience of really just engaging in the material. Then what's going to happen is that um, on our next lesson, uh, I will give you what I call a review slide, which is well, it will have everything on, on that review slide will be everything from the previous lecture that's going to be on the exam uh, or that is potential for exam. Does that make sense? So uh, the review slides are pretty long and I'll show you those next time in lecture, what would that be? Three, right? I'll show you uh, your first review slide uh, and it will have all this material on there. So um, now take notes if it helps you pay close attention to have the better experience then by all means take notes uh, and please don't use the review slides as an excuse to kind of not pay attention to the lecture uh, because you got to understand something the review slides are meant to be a review they're not meant to be the first time you see material so um, it doesn't quite work I've, I've had students do that before where they're like well I can kind of check out during the lecture and just really tune in for the review slides and, you know, you might be able to, to, to get some questions right on the exam, but you're really not going to understand everything because the review slides sometimes just have key words and things that you're supposed to remember from the lecture. It really is a review slide. But, uh, so, and, and you'll figure it out as you go, but uh, I hope to just engage you 100% in this material. It's harder because I'm not in front of you and... Um, uh, you know, able to judge your reaction. So I'm going to try to keep it exciting and fun, and uh, and hopefully you find this uh, find this stuff interesting. All right. So no notes if you don't want them. Just uh, just really try to envision what we're talking about here. Let's start with Saint Jerome. So Jerome is a is a is a priest uh, in uh, the the fourth century. Um, he he doesn't love scriptures though he finds it kind of boring. Um, so, and I know you're like, oh, I've never done that. I've never found scripture boring. Yeah, he finds scripture kind of boring, but he loves to read the writings of a Roman philosopher named Cicero. Now, um, so he, one night, he has a dream. Uh, how old is he? If we go back and look at his birthday, 347, the dream is in 375. Well, what's that? He's, he's 30s. Um, so he has uh, this dream, 347, 377 would make him 30. So he's like 28, is that right? I can't do math right now. I think it's the pressure. Okay, um, where was I? Oh, okay, so he has this dream and uh, he gets, well, before the dream, he was just not feeling well and uh, he went to bed. So uh, he goes and lays down and he dies. And he didn't realize that he was like that sick, right? So um, when he dies, he wasn't expecting to die. Would you be ready to die tonight? Like if you lay down in bed and all of a sudden you realize you're in the spirit world and you're like, uh, wow, I was not prepared for this. So in his, um, he dies and he goes to the judgment. Uh, and this is uh, kind of a painting that was done with his judgment. You can see Jesus is over there on the left, right? So um it's just him and Jesus at the beginning of the dream, or sorry, of the, of his death. You're not supposed to know it's a dream yet. So he is there and uh, Jesus comes out and he says, who are you? 
And Jerome says, I am Jerome, I am a Christian. And Jesus says, uh, you lie. Would you be like, oh man, oh, uh, would you be like, okay, which way is hell, right? Be, uh, Jesus like, you liar. And um, then he said, Jesus softened a little bit and he said, uh, Jerome, you are a follower of Cicero, not of Christ. And Jerome, um, he's kind of banished at that point, and he's taken to be punished by these other people who are there. Um, and uh, he wakes up, and he realizes it was a dream. And he really believes that it is a message from God for him to spend more time in the scriptures. So uh, he he basically gives up the writings of Cicero. He ba He basically gives up every other writing except for scripture and devotes his life um, to reading the scriptures. Now, I like this dream because it helps us. I think it's applicable to us. If you were to die today and Jesus said, um, you know, you're there and you said, I am, you know, I am Emily, I am a Christian. And Jesus says, no, you don't spend your time with me. You spend your time somewhere else. What would it be? You are a follower of not Cicero, obviously, you are a follower of Instagram. You are a follower of ESPN, although not the last few weeks, right? You are a follower of fill in the blank, right? Where do you spend most of your time? In fact, answer this question. If we were to judge your Christianity based on one thing, how often and how much, how often you read the scriptures and how much you love them, what kind of Christian would you be? probably a little bit like Jerome where you're like, Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I spent a little bit of time in the scriptures. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an applicable dream, right? That Jerome has. Well, he wakes up and he devotes his life to scripture. All right, let's go to our next slide. So uh, don't read it up yet. Just focus on me here for a second. I can, I could probably just take this down, but uh, just focus on the tiny guy in the, in the box there. All right. So, um, Jerome starts devoting his life, like I said, to reading the scriptures, and he reads Latin. Um, and he, as he's reading, realizes that he's not getting the scriptures in their original languages. What were the original languages of the scriptures? See if you, if you know this. The Old Testament original language would have been Hebrew, and the New Testament, the original language would be Greek. And you'll understand why here. Um, uh, at the end of our lecture. But uh, so he's reading in Latin and he's thinking, I don't know if I have, how do I know what, what I'm reading is correct? Um, I don't know how often you've thought that before, right? As you're reading the scriptures going, how good is this translation? Uh, so Jerome, um, he petitions the Pope. He wants to, he needs the funds. He is going to move back to um, not back. He's going to move to Israel. Now, at this time, um, there's not a lot of Christians and Jews in Israel. They've been since long kicked out. Uh, it's becoming more of an Arab uh, Muslim place. But he wants to move there, and he wants to learn the original languages from the people that are still there. Uh, so he wants to learn uh, Hebrew and he wants to learn Greek from the Jews and the Christians that are still there. And uh, the Pope gives him this permission. So he moves to Bethlehem, the original Bethlehem where Jesus is born. He moves to Bethlehem and he, uh, he starts learning these languages. Now that's a devotion to scripture study, right? I don't know if I've, I don't know if I've ever, um, I only know of one other person who is that devoted to scriptures where they're like, I, I want to read the original languages. Uh, and that's Joseph Smith. Did you know Joseph Smith, his whole life, uh, well, not his whole life, as, as soon as he could, you know, became president of the church, probably in Kirtland. He had a, he had a Greek tutor and a Hebrew tutor. He wanted to learn these original languages. It's just a devotion to scripture study. Well, um, as Jerome goes through this process of learning these languages, he realizes that the Latin version that the church is using, the Catholic church, is not correct in many, many ways. So he asks the Pope for, again, more funds to retranslate the scriptures uh, from um, their original Greek and Hebrew. Now, did he have the originals? There's no way of saying. I doubt it. Um, we obviously do not have any of the originals of uh, any of the of any of the, at least the four gospels. Well, we don't have any of the originals of anything, but um, so he's going to take them at least from copies 
uh, of those originals, uh, Hebrew and Greek, and he's going to retranslate them into Latin. And you can see right up here, I think you read this in the Bible dictionary, one of the most important of the early versions of the, of the New Testament is the Vulgate, which was a revised Latin text made by Jerome in the fourth century. So the, the translation that Jerome creates is called the Vulgate. It's from the word common in Latin, which is vulgar, right? Um, so he creates the Vulgate or the common Bible. So that Vulgate is instrumental in the written Bible. Uh, it is the parent, you can read on the slide here, the parent of all the translations into modern language of Western Europe, including English. So um, Jerome's, uh, if your Bible, if your little King James Bible went to a family reunion and saw the Vulgate, it would be like, grandpa, right? And go jump up in its arms. Uh, it is, the Vulgate is crucial to what becomes the Bible you and I read every day. And uh, by the way, the Catholic Church still uses the Vulgate. It hasn't been redone in a better way, right? There's probably people who've tried to redo it and it's just, you don't get any better. Uh, Jerome was um, absolutely incredible. Now, if you go to Bethlehem today, let's see if I can get this to move here. If you go to Bethlehem today, um, right outside of the, of the church where, so there's two churches built right on top of uh, the site of the supposed site or the traditional site of Jesus's birth. Um, uh, I've been there quite a few times and uh, it is always fun for me to see this statue of Jerome. So, um, so apparently he goes to Bethlehem and does his work pretty much at the site where Jesus is born or traditionally was born. Now, um, I've seen this statue many times, uh, but I was, I was there once and I had never noticed that skull. Now I know you're like, how could you miss the skull? Well, you, you, you're getting like an eye level view here. The, the thing sits, the statue's way up high. So if you're down below it, you can't even see, you know, his feet or anything. Um, but I, I can't, I was back further once and I looked back and I thought, oh, I've never seen that. So I asked, uh, one of the guides there, I was like, why, why, uh, is there a skull there? And he said, oh, this is a great story. Um, and it is a great story. Apparently when Jerome was doing his translation, you guys, he had a human skull on his desk. He kept it there right on his desk. And, um, it was to remind him that when he got tired, that death was coming <laughs> and that he had to finish. Is that incredible, right? Can you imagine? Uh, we, should, uh, we should get all of, uh, should all of us get a human skull on our, our deaths, uh, our deaths, on our desks to, you know, anytime we're like, I'm too tired, I don't want to do my homework. Death is coming, right? Finish your job. So maybe we could all get like a big letter F on our desk. It's like, finish. Uh, it would stand for finish, not fail. Okay. Um, do you love Jerome? Uh, he is just, to me, he is just a fantastic figure from history that more people should be talking about. Uh, by the way, um, I think, and I, I can't go into this because I just don't have time, but Jerome is living during the time of what's called the, the formation of the Nicene Creed. So can you see that as the, the doctrines are changing um, over, you know, for the church, that the Lord is kind of um, is at work here uh, to bring about the the reformation and the restoration. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's just kind of cool that he's living during this same time period, uh, the first Nicene Creed, and he lives basically between the first and the second creeds. Uh, and here he is um, creating a Bible that's going to have influence on, of course, the restoration of the gospel. Okay, we've got to move forward. I could talk about this forever. The next person we're going to talk about is John Wycliffe. Now, um, we're going to have to jump a thousand years in the future. Can you see that by the dates? A thousand years. And a lot happens in that thousand years that we just can't cover. But uh, John Wycliffe, he connects to uh, Jerome in, uh, in the translation. So uh, let me tell you about him. John Wycliffe is going to be the very first person. Now, some people are like, isn't his name John Wycliffe? Well, if you're from America, he's named John Wycliffe. But if, you're, if you want to know his real name, is the name that people called him, it was John Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Okay. Now, take a look. He, John Wycliffe is going to be the very first person 
to put the Bible in English. The first English version of the Bible is associated with the name John Wycliffe. These versions were made from the Latin. What was Jerome's Bible called? Starts with a V. Do you remember? The Vulgate. These, John Wycliffe used the Vulgate to um, create an English Bible, the very first one. And the work was circulated far and wide. Now, why does he do this? Um, he, he basically becomes what the father of the rest of the Reformation. So what Joseph Smith is to the Restoration, John Wycliffe, I just broke my own rule, John Wycliffe is to the Reformation. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not sure he meant to be. Uh, he had some problems with what he saw in the church. Uh, he was very educated, educated at Oxford, spoke many languages. Um, and so when people who spoke English went to church, they would hear their their cleric or their priest teach in uh, would would teach in English, but the Bible was only written in Latin, the Vulgate, right? So basically, the priest, uh, being the only person in the room besides people like John Wycliffe, who are pretty rare, uh, that can read Latin or and speak Latin, so. I, basically, if I'm a corrupt priest, I can tell you the Bible says whatever I want it to say. I can say, hey, listen, the Bible says that if you want to be forgiven of your sins, you've got to pay your priest, right? And nobody knows that's not what the Bible says, so they would pay. Um, and there was other things he had problems with. So take a look at our list down here. He disapproved of clerical celibacy. Uh, this idea that clerics couldn't be married, uh, priests couldn't be married. He's like, that's not in the scriptures anywhere. Peter himself was married. Um, pilgrimages, like the idea that you've got to travel um, back to a certain city uh, to have these certain blessings. He's like, that's not in the Bible anywhere. The selling of indulgences, that's the one we just talked about, where to be forgiven of your sins, you need to pay your priest. Um, and once they, once you've been forgiven of your sins, uh, the money stops coming in, right? So um, I would tell you that grandma and grandpa never paid for their sins and they're sitting in purgatory. They're in hell right now waiting for you to pay for them, right? And of course, I mean, what are you going to do? Eat dinner or are you going to get grandma out of hell? Which one are you going to pay for, right? Well, I mean, you can see why this bothered him so much. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't approve of the idea of praying to saints. Again, not in the Bible anywhere. So, uh, he said, now, he, I don't think he was completely against the Catholic Church as a whole, but he was against the, uh, the immorality that was in, you know, the higher ups of the church, the priests. And he said, listen, you can't be immoral and then, you know, offer these sacraments that you say are giving people salvation. You, you can't do that. That's our second line. Um, and he didn't like that, uh, that clerics had their own courts. Uh, so the idea is that they committed a crime. They couldn't be tried by the government. They had to be tried by the church, which, you know, if you've got friends in there, then you're going to get off the hook. So he had a lot of problems with this, and he started printing the Bible in English. Now, you need to understand um, that it was almost a perfect storm because something happens during his lifetime that changes, um, that changes the face of Europe, and that's called the Black Death. So between 1346 and 1353, let's go back and look at John Wycliffe, 1328 to 1384. So you can see he's living during the Black Death. Um, you guys, I don't think we can quite fathom this. Now, we are experiencing a global pandemic right now, but uh, what do we got? Uh, uh, we've got a pretty low mortality rate, right? This takes one third of the population one out of every three people, not one out of every three people that gets it, one out of every three people on the planet or in Europe die from the Black Death. So if you've got nine people in your family, think of your extended family. If you've got 30 people in your extended family, you're going to bury 10 of them, 10 of them in what, five, six years. I mean, it was, you've probably seen the Monty Python sketches, right? Like, bring out your dead. I'm not dead yet. You, you're halfway dead. You'll be dead by morning. No, I'm happy, right? No. I mean, it's all, it's just this terrible, terrible time. Now, think about this. If you are living in Europe and you have been paying and paying and paying money to be forgiven of your sins and to pay for grandma and grandpa's sins, and then the Black Death hits, and you're burying your friends and your family, 
Um, now, some people are like, well, didn't they get used to death? And they're probably used to that, right? No, they love their family and friends just like you do. So, and then you get the Bible in English. And then you find out that it didn't say that at all, right? It never said um, that uh, you had to pay for your sins. And um, I mean, it would just... It, it created a, a lot of anger and the peasants revolt hits in 1381. So about 30 years later, um, the peasants revolt of 1381, and it is a massive revolt. And uh, basically uh, it's peasants going into homes um, of, you know, the wealthy or uh, the high ups in the church and killing everyone, killing their whole family killing everything. So the revolt happens in 1381. Well, Wycliffe dies in 1384. Oh, I want to show you this quote uh, that he said about the Pope. He, he, he didn't see the, the, the position of Pope as a, uh, a biblical position. He said, the Pope is a man subject to sin, but Christ is the Lord of Lords, and this kingdom is to be held directly and solely of Christ alone. Um, so this idea that the Pope couldn't sin, right, uh, is that he, that he is, you know, basically a, a demigod kind of to be worshipped. He's like, no, uh, we should only be worshipping one person. Well, notice that he dies in 1384, so three years after the peasants' revolt. Well, when this whole thing gets cleaned up, um, they, they, they want some answers, right? As they look back uh, by the beginning of the next century, the 1400s, they're looking back and they're thinking, okay, what happened? Why did that revolt occur? And they realize that there were some contributing factors, right? The Black Death, um, the, uh, the, the lying done by the clerics, and getting the Bible in English. Well, guess which one they make illegal? You can't make the Black Death illegal. You could make, you know, your clerics being immoral and, you know, you could make indulgences. You could say, okay, that's true. It's not right. But instead of doing that, they make the Bible in English illegal so they can continue these uh, terrible practices. Um, it's this guy, uh, Thomas um, Arundel, right? You're like, Arundel. Um, sorry. He's the uh, Archbishop, Archbishop in Canterbury in England, and he forbids anyone of their own initiative to translate any portion of the scriptures into English. So instead of like looking at themselves and thinking we should correct our bad behavior, they, they make the English Bible illegal. And just to prove their point that if you print the Bible in English, you are a heretic and God doesn't love you, they dig John Wycliffe up. 44 years after he dies, they dig him up and burn him. I don't know what's left of him. 44 years later. Um, and he has followers. Remember this name. Wycliffe has followers and they're called Lollards. L-O-L-L-A-R-D-S. Lollards. And they saw this happen. They, they saw them, you know, they make the Bible illegal in English and then they... Uh, they dig John Wycliffe up, up and they, they burn him. And then they take his ashes. And instead of putting them in a, you know, a hollowed grave, right, a, uh, a sacred place, they dump it in a river. And that's supposed to shame him, right, that, he's, he, that God doesn't love him and that he's just, he has no burial spot. Well, it kind of creates a prophecy. Uh, this is... Um, uh, this is kind of a, this statement here is from basically what the Lollards would say. They burnt his bones, Wycliffe's bones to ashes and cast them. My screens cut this off here. So they cast them into the Swift. That's a, like a Creek. Uh, if you're from Utah, it's a Creek, uh, a neighboring brook running um, hard by. Thus the brook then took his ashes, the, the, the crick took his ashes uh, into the Avon, which is another river, and the Avon into Severn, Severn into the seas, into the ocean, uh, or then into the ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe are an emblem or a symbol of his doctrine, the English Bible, which is now dispersed the world over. So they saw this as kind of a martyrdom and a prophecy. This is what they would say. Um, the Lollards to each other, his followers. The Avon to the Severn runs, 
the Severn to the sea, and Wycliffe's dust shall spread abroad, wide as the waters be. I always break into it like a pirate voice there at the end. I don't know, it just sounds like you got something you gotta say as a pirate, wide as the waters be. So Wycliffe, you guys, um, gets more power by being burned, right? By being dug up and burned 44 years after he dies. Well, guess who is a Lollard? About a hundred years later, after Wycliffe's death, death comes uh, one of the greatest people in ever. Uh, his name is William Tyndale, and William Tyndale is a Lollard. He's a follower of John Wycliffe. He believes people should have the Bible in English. But here's a problem, you guys: it's illegal. So, what do you do? Um, William Tyndale is a master of languages. Uh, he is uh, a scholar at Oxford. He could have any job him he wants. In fact, Henry VIII, who is king, do you see how they're born about the same time? Um, he offers uh, Tyndale a place basically in his court that says, uh, you can live off of the kingdom and study. You can have a life of books and paper and all your needs will be taken care of. And here you go. But Henry's a faithful Catholic, at least at the time. And um, Tyndale wouldn't be able to print the Bible in English. So what do you do? Do you follow the comfortable life, the life that, um, you know, that you kind of dream of and having all the resources that you need? Or do you go with your passion? Uh, and that is printing the Bible in English. Well, uh, since we're talking about him, I, I bet you can guess what he did. Uh, he decides to, he is going to print the Bible in English. Now, um, Tyndale is the first person to create an English Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek texts. Uh, so when Wycliffe, remember when Wycliffe did his, he got his from the Vulgate. He used the Latin and he translated it in, the Latin into English. Well, uh, Tyndale, he uses Wycliffe's translation, of course, as a, to help him, um, but he actually has uh, copies, of course, of the original text in Hebrew and Greek, and he uses those. You, apparently, Tyndale uh, spoke like 15 different languages, could pick up on them in, in, in a matter of days. Uh, just incredible, incredible guy. Um, and he starts printing the Bible in English, which of course makes him a criminal. So he has to live the rest of his life on the run. Uh, he's basically running all over Europe, just trying to stay away from um, people who are trying to find him for printing the Bible in English. Sir Thomas More is one who is always trying to find him. And in fact, uh, as they're trying to find him, he writes, uh, if God will spare my life, I bet you've heard, heard this before. If God will spare my life, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than the Pope himself, right? So here he is writing uh, the Bible in English, and they're smuggling them into England. They'd put them at the bottom of um, barrels, like false bottoms of barrels. They would, uh, they would sew them inside of coats. Uh, just absolutely incredible. And if the church gets hold of them in England, if you're caught with one, um, you're a heretic, and they, they burn you uh, at the stake. Now, they don't normally... Uh, kill women. So if you were caught with one and you're a female, they're going to kill your husband uh, or they're going to um, your oldest son, something like that. Uh, there was a few women killed. I'm going to tell you about one a little bit later, but um, there was a little boy. He's uh, 11, 10 years old, uh, and he's caught with the Lord's Prayer uh, in his coat pocket. And uh, they burn him uh, for having that, that Bible in English. Um, so here is Tyndale printing them, uh, mostly from Cologne, Germany. He's printing them, getting them into England, and the church is hunting them down and burning them and also looking for him. It's, a, in, it's an intense story of um, sometimes he, he has to like run because he gets word that they're onto him where he is, and they're like hours apart. He'll clean up his stuff, grab as much as he can, and flee to another city, and hours later, the church police are there, right? Remember that the church runs everything, both church and state at, at this time. And that's one of the reasons Henry VIII doesn't love the church. It's because they're always telling him what to do as king. Okay, now, a couple of things I wanted you to notice. Sorry, we got to put my computer down here. But uh, I want you to notice um, kind of this idea of what I call the pen of heaven. Uh, and that is 
that when Tyndale writes the Bible in English, can you imagine being there for the very first time as he writes in English, the, you know, ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, right? That's the very first time that's ever written. I'd just be like, ah, that's great. Um, listen to his patterns. He's got, he's got an incredible rhythm when it comes to English. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is, there's eight syllables on one side of the word for, and there's eight syllables on the other side of the word for. Uh, same with, um, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, right? You've got this, there's a, there's a divine cadence to the English Bible, and I, I'm 100% uh, believe that, that William Tyndale wrote with the pen of heaven, uh, that God just gave him this incredible gift. He created words in English when, you know, those of you who've done translation know that there's sometimes words uh, in, the, uh, in the source language um, that aren't in the target language. So you've got to do your best to convey an idea. So he would create new English words uh, like Jehovah. That was not a word um, until William Tyndale translated it uh, into English, created the word Jehovah. And the word atonement, possibly the most important word in our, um, in our, right, in our church, religion, vernacular, um, he created that word, uh, atonement. So I just, I'm a big fan of William Tyndale. In fact, I, I, we have twin boys who are seven and I wanted to name them uh, when they were born. I wanted to name them Wycliffe and Tyndale. And my wife said, no, uh, she said they'd make fun of them. Who would make fun of Cliff and Tin, right? Those are awesome. Maybe I'll, maybe one day I'll have two dogs and I'll name them Wycliffe and Tyndale. I bet she'll let me do that. All right, so, um, oh, you guys, it's so sad. Um, William Tyndale is turned in by his best friend, Henry Phillips. Oh, how much money would it take for you to turn in your best friend? Oh, Phillips says, uh, William, meet me for dinner. And instead of meeting him, he meets the, the church's basically police. Um, they take him to, you, you read about this in Elder Christofferson's talk. They take him to a castle in Belgium and imprison him there for 18 months. And then they bring him out and they're going to burn him alive. Um, and uh, they're going to strangle him. So as they bring him out, get this. I mean, this is, as they bring him out, he says, they ask him if he would like to repent. Uh, the word is recant, but in you and I, we would say repent. Would you like to recant before you meet God? And he says back to, in front of the whole crowd, to these high up um, Catholics, he says, would you like to recant before I meet God? I mean, he is, he, he's a believer. So um, as they're preparing to strangle him and burn him alive, the very last thing he says is, dear God, open the King of England's eyes. Dear God, open the King of England's eyes. Well, why? Because there's been rumors going on about the King of England, um, and that he is a—he's going to do something uh, that um, that is that no one saw coming, and he is Henry the Eighth. All right. So, by the way, when I put these four on here, I don't mean to say that they're—I I would say it like this. Um, one of these four is not like the others. Uh, Henry VIII, these, uh, Jerome is a great guy. Wycliffe, great guy. Tyndale, great guy. Henry, guy. Uh, because he's just not like the others. Uh, but he, he is important uh, because he wants, he's going to make a break from the Catholic Church. Um, so let's go back to this here before we read that. So, um, uh, most of you know the story, uh, or you've at least heard it, that Henry uh, is married and um, his wife is not um, bearing a son, uh, and he's very frustrated uh, with her, and he wants an heir to the throne. He doesn't want it to go out of his, um, out of his family line. So uh, he, he petitions the church to get a divorce so he can marry one of his mistresses. He's got many. He's going to marry one of his mistresses so he can have an heir to the throne. He can, you know, try a different girl to uh, try a different wife, basically to have a son. Um, and the church turns him down and says, no, uh, you can't do that. 
Um, now, it's kind of interesting in a church that breaks all sorts of laws and rules, right, that the Pope won't allow it. But the Pope feels like, listen, if I allow you to do this, then all the other kings uh, are going to want to do this too. And so, no. Now, Henry's a faithful Catholic, you guys. Uh, he once got an award from the Pope for being such a faith faithful Catholic. But this really gets under his skin. And then, um, think about this. So, Henry is like kind of like, the church is always telling me what to do. And why won't they let me do this? I want a son. And he's got closet Protestants in his cabinet who are pretending to be faithful Catholics. So a Protestant is basically the word Protestant comes from the word protester. Okay. Protestant is in our language protester. So you've got Catholics and Protestants or basically pro-Catholic and anti-Catholic at this time. But he thinks they're all Catholic. He thinks they're all faithful Catholics too, but they're really Protestants. And they want what Tyndale wants. They want the Bible in English. So they're kind of manipulating him. And they're saying, you know what you ought to do is you ought to break from the Catholic church and create your own church. And guess who will be Pope? And he's like, who? you king you will be the new pope he's like well that sounds better and uh, guess what you can get in this new church you can get a divorce you really ought to do this and he's thinking you're faithful catholics and you think this maybe i should but they're not faithful catholics they're really protestants uh and guess what they get him to do as he's breaking with the church he they said you know what you really ought to do you ought to you ought to give people the bible in english He's like, wait, isn't that bad? And they're like, yeah, no, it's good. And he's like, well, you're faithful Catholics. So yeah, let's do it. So you can see that in Henry promised the English people that they should have the New Testament in their own tongue. And in April of 1539 appears uh, the great, the first edition of the great Bible. See how close we are to William Tyndale? Dear God, open the king of England's eyes, 1536. Well, in 1539 appeared the first edition of the great Bible. Uh, so the Bible is now printed in mass in English and no one's stopping it, right? At least not in England. And um, you can't stop it from there. Uh, eventually it's going to make its way across the Atlantic Ocean and into the hands of the boy who drives the plow right? Uh, absolutely um, incredible story. Now, um, I felt badly that as I talked about these four, women, four men, that we didn't talk about any women. Um, and that would be mostly because women were not as educated, didn't have the chance for education, and so they wouldn't be doing any of the publishing, right? Or the, the translating. Uh, translating, I said that word. Um, but I did want to tell you about one woman, and she can kind of be representative of many women during her time. And her name is Anne Askew. I remember teaching this once, and one of my students found me on Twitter after the lesson, about an hour, a couple hours after the lesson. She said, uh, I have been reading, I can't get past Anne Askew. I've been reading about her all day. Uh, and I, I found one of my new heroes, like, thank you, Brother Smith. Um, she, if you've never heard her story, it's pretty incredible. So Anne Askew is one of these women who um, she can read and she's, she is helping push the English Bible uh, that Tyndale is printing. She's helping it kind of go, um, you know, to families and other people secretly. So she's one of these people who, who is it like a smuggler. Okay, so as the Bible, the English Bible is coming from Germany, from Tyndale, she is smuggling it in, helping people get it. Well, she keeps, she gets caught, but they don't know, they, they don't execute women. And so they just keep taking her back to her faithful Catholic husband and saying, you need to control your wife. And he's like, Anne, you've got to stop this. And she's like, okay. And then she just goes back and does it again. Well, she gets caught so many times uh, that they, they've got to punish her somehow. Now they're not going to execute her again. Her husband's a very faithful, high up Catholic. Uh, and so they, they decide they're going to find other people through her. So they tell her that they want um, the, her contacts. She, they want the name of the men who are working with her getting the Bible in English. And she just flat out refuses to tell them. Um, and they said, no, you have to tell us. And you've got a couple of these crazy clerics who, are, who really want 
you know, this information and really want her to be punished. And so they put her in the rack. Um, if you've, this is the rack, this isn't an in the rack, but this is a rack. So the idea is that we're going to stretch you out, right? Um, we're going to pull on your arms and legs uh, and tighten it until you are in so much pain that you're going to give us this information. So they put her in the rack and you guys, she will not give up these names. Um, and they've got her in so much pain and uh, she won't give up these names. And eventually people start backing out. Some of these uh, people who were there in the beginning, they're like, I can't be part of this, uh, torturing a woman. It ends up just being her and two other guys in this, uh, in this room with this rack. And she says to them, in all this torture, I'd rather read five lines in the English Bible than to hear five Catholic masses. Well, uh, they said that her, um, I think it was her wrists that popped out first, uh, wrists, and then um, they ended up pulling apart all her joints, her ankles, her knees, her hips, her shoulders and elbows, and all of her joints were ripped apart. Um, and she'll never, obviously never walk again. She'll never, um, she'll, uh, she won't live much longer, right? Uh, with this happening to her. And uh, she won't give up the names. She absolutely won't give up the names. And so they do the only thing they think they can. Uh, and that is they carry her to the stake because she can't be, um, she can't walk. They carry her to the stake and, uh, and burn her and ask you, right? Uh, and she is just a representative of, of, so many people just like her who, man, they believed in that English Bible. So you read from Elder Christofferson. He said this, and I want you to answer this question just in your head. What did they know about the importance of the scriptures that we also need to know? What did people in 16th century England who paid enormous sums and ran grave personal risks for access to a Bible, that's all they wanted was just access to an English Bible, what did they understand that we should also understand? Just kind of answer that in your head. Why, you know, why were they so willing to give up their lives and to give up, you know, livelihoods uh, like Tyndale just for an English Bible? That's it, just for an English Bible. Um, this is Elder Ballard. He kind of answers the question where he says, honest, diligent study of the Bible does make us better and better. And we must ever remember the countless martyrs who knew of its power and who gave their lives that we may be able to find within its words, the path to eternal happiness and the peace of our heavenly father's kingdom. So you can see him kind of answering that question, right? The path to eternal happiness, uh, the peace of understanding God's kingdom. Um, but I'm going to leave uh, the last word on this to William Tyndale. Uh, now, this is just awesome. Uh, and I think it might sum up why they loved it so much, why they wanted it so badly. He says, though we read scripture and babble of it ever so much. You guys, that is my job to read scripture and babble of it. He said, but if we don't know the use of it and why it was given, and what in what is in what's what's in there to be sought? What is in the, What is therein to be sought? It profits us nothing at all. So you can read scripture and talk about it, but if you don't know why it was given and you don't know what you're looking for, it's not going to help you. So oh, look at this paragraph. It is not enough, therefore, to read and talk of it only. It is not enough to read scripture and talk about it. We must desire God day and night, pray to open our eyes and make us understand and feel. So it's not about reading and talking about scripture. It's about understanding and feeling why the scripture was given, that we may apply the medicine of the scripture. Do you see why he found it so profound? It's medicine. He sees the scripture as medicine uh, that goes along with Jacob, right? The, the pleasing word of God, which heals the wounded soul that we may apply the medicine of the scripture, every man or woman to their own source. So as you read, therefore, think that every syllable pertains to your own self. Not every word, every syllable pertains to your own self. Oh man, is that good or what? 
All right, we're going to take a break. So we'll just call this part one. And I'm going to come back with part two. Uh, just another link on YouTube. We'll do a part two uh, for the history of Israel. So take a break, stand up, get a drink, eat something. Maybe, you know, uh, you obviously can watch these anytime. Uh, but um, I'll, uh, if you go back to the YouTube channel we created, uh, you can see, uh, and I'll send you a link for the other video. Don't you just love the history of the English Bible? Oh, man, to me, it's fantastic. All right, my friends, I'll see you soon. Stop share and bye.